back into Exodus. We had moved a little bit into chapter 5, so we'll review what we had started. It started a brand new section of uh, Moses being back from Mount Sinai and with uh, Pharaoh for the first time. So we want to pick that up together. So, let's review verses 1 to 9. <coughs> Afterward, Moses and Aaron went and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Let my people go. That's where the movie usually stops. But he, he adds, That they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice and let Israel go? I do not know Yahweh, and moreover I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Yahweh our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people away from their work? Get back to your burdens. And Pharaoh said, Behold, the people of the land are, are now many, and you make them rest from their burdens. The same day Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and their foremen, You shall no longer give the people straw to make bricks, as in the past. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the number of bricks that they made in the past you shall, not, you shall impose on them. You shall by no means reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cried, Let us go and offer sacrifices to our God. Let heavier work be laid on the men that they may labor at it, and pay no regard to lying words. So he thinks that they're lying. Uh, the key phrase here that we're going to see repeated throughout Pharaoh's hardness, throughout his hardened heart, the next several chapters, is the phrase listening. He starts off by saying, Who is Yahweh that I should listen to his voice? And from then on it'll say, not just that he hardens his heart, but that he will not listen. That will be one of the keys to understanding what this doctrine of the hardening of Pharaoh's heart and the hardened hearts of any unbeliever, uh, if we're going to understand their hardness of hearts, we have to get to the, the core of what happens to a heart that hears God's word. Faith is created. When the ear and the heart are hardened, it's because they are not listening. Faith comes by hearing. He already starts out by saying he will not listen. So let's continue on where we left off last time. He's given this order to the foreman, which includes some of Israel, uh, that their tally of bricks does not go down, but now they have to do the added step. They have to go gather some of the materials. He's thinking, you're asking for a holiday to go worship your God because you're lazy, you're idle, you don't have enough work to do. I can solve that problem for you. Here's some extra work. So. Verses 10 to 14. So the taskmasters and the foremen of the people went out and said to the people, this would be the people of Israel, Thus says Pharaoh, I will not give you straw. Go and get your straw yourselves wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced in the least. So the people were scattered throughout all the land of Egypt, to gather straw for stubble, or stubble for straw. The taskmasters were urgent, saying, Complete your work, your daily task, each day, as, where, as when there was straw. And the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten, and were asked, Why have you not done all your task of making bricks today and yesterday as in the past? So who are the taskmasters and who are the foremen? The taskmasters would be Egyptian or Israel? Egyptian. They're the guys walking around with whips enforcing the rule. Who are the foremen? They're of the people of Israel and they're getting the lashings, the beatings, for the rest of the people not finishing their work. Uh, it's reminiscent of Galatians 4, 1 to 7. If you want to turn there, let's look at that quickly. Uh, it gives, in Galatians 4, Paul will bring up 
uh, the law as a type of taskmaster. So Galatians 4, 1 to 7. All right, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. But he is under guardians and managers until the day set by his father. So a child is under guardians or managers. What's a slave under? Taskmaster. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Redeem. A word for buying out of slavery, right? Rescuing from the taskmasters and bringing them into the status of children instead of slaves. Because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir from God. So, I'm not going to overread it into Exodus as if it's some kind of allegory, just to give you the example of how there is a difference between how a child is raised under uh, a guardian and how a slave is treated by his taskmaster. And that under the law, we are under a cruel taskmaster. But by redemption through Christ, we are not a slave to the law. We are a child of God, an heir. There is still the law. It's, it still exists, and it's there as a guardian. But it's not there as a taskmaster to beat and kill us. It kills our old Adam. But we are children of God, new life through baptism into Christ. And that changes the picture. We'll come back to that by the end of today. All right, let's go on to verses 15 to 21. The foremen have just been beaten. Let's remember that. So now they're going to go to Israel. Then the foremen of the sons of Israel came and cried to Pharaoh, Why do you treat your servants like this? No straw is given to your servants, yet they say to us, Make bricks. Behold, your servants are beaten, but the fault is in your own people. But he said, You are idle. You are idle. That is why you say, Let us go and sacrifice to Yahweh. Go now and work. No straw will be given you, but you must still deliver the same number of bricks. The foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble when they said, You shall by no means reduce your number of bricks, your daily task each day. They met Moses and Aaron, who were waiting for them as they came out from Pharaoh. And they said to them, Yahweh, look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants, and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. So, they ask for rest to go worship, Moses and Aaron did. Pharaoh calls them idle. He punishes the people. The people go in saying, why are you doing this? And he calls them idle again. He doubles it. You are idle, you are idle. That's why you want to go and worship your God. This is why it's happening. Let's remind ourselves, what is the purpose of the day of rest in Scripture? What is the purpose of the day of rest? If you were here over the holidays when we had a special Bible study on holidays, you might remember it. Think about the third commandment. Is it about idleness? No. Taking it easy, feet up. No, what's the point of the day of rest? Set aside. Hear God's word. Exercise ourselves in the word of God. So all week long you exercise yourself in your careers, your professions, your many vocations. We set aside a day of rest, not to sleep in, sorry, uh, but to exercise yourself in God's Word more than you are capable when you are living in your vocations. Uh, that's the whole point of God's day of rest. You will have your vocations. I mean, this is why Lutherans were always giving up the monastery life. It's not a holier form of life to give up family, to give up work, and do nothing all day. That's not good. That's not what God created man for either. So you have your vocations. You do your work every day. But we set aside the day of rest to be refreshed in God's Word, to be refreshed 
in what he would have us learn, knowing that you can't do it every day. You can't give up your life and become a monk or a nun. That's not what God wants either. All right, so, since the, day, since the days of creation, God has set aside a day of rest where his people would worship him, hear his word, not be idle, but to hear and grow in that word. Uh, one of our church fathers, Basil the Great, <coughs> cheerful looking guy, uh, said, even Pharaoh knew that it was proper for one to seek God when he was unoccupied. And for this reason, he reproached Israel. You're not occupied enough. You are idle. And you say, we shall offer prayers to the Lord our God. Now, leisure itself is good and useful to him who is unoccupied, since it produces quiet for the acquisition of salutary doctrines. Right? You just fill your life with busyness. Uh, that's not good either. You won't think and have time for prayer or anything else. But quiet has a good use. But the leisure of the Athenians was evil. From Acts chapter 17. The Athenians, what did they do? They used to spend all their leisure telling or listening to something new. New and false teachings, false gods. Paul comments on that in Acts 17. Uh, and Basil goes on, even at the present time, some imitate this misusing the leisure of life for the discovery of some newer teaching. So not to exercise themselves in God's word, but to wander around in silly myths, try something new, waste their time. Alright. Back to the text. In the face of these burdens, what do they ask? <coughs> Are they more worried about the sword of Pharaoh or the word of Yahweh that has finally visited his people after 400 years? Yeah. Listen again to the, to the foreman, what they say to Moses and Aaron as they leave Pharaoh's court. Yahweh, look on you and judge, because you have made us stink in the sight of Pharaoh and his servants and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Not very trusting. Starting the grumbling that we hear about later chapters, like in our Old Testament lesson today. Right? They are more concerned with uh, the earthly reality of their job, their slavery, and what Pharaoh will do to them if they don't complete the task, as opposed to the promises that Yahweh had given Moses and Aaron to proclaim in their ears, which we heard about two weeks ago, which the elders initially received with joy. God has visited his people. He's heard our cries. He's going to redeem us from slavery. Well, now that the cross, the persecution comes, they give it up rather quickly. They turn on Moses and Aaron. And we're going to see that now trickle down to the people. From the foreman to the people. All right, stop me if there's any questions. If not, we'll get through the set of verses and pick it up there. All right, chapter 522 to 6-1, follow along with me. <coughs> then Moses turned to Yahweh and said, O Adonai, O Lord, why have you done evil to this people? Why did you ever send me? For since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people. You have not delivered your people at all. And Yahweh said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand, he will send them out. And with a strong hand, he will drive them out of his land. All right. So, Moses here is the foreman. Now he's frustrated, and he asks God several questions. Why have you done evil to your people? And that's a question that has resonated throughout the Christian history to this very day. It's one of the most troubling questions that atheists and skeptics will pose to Christians. It's called the problem of evil. How can there be a good God if he allows bad things to happen to good people? And even if you convince them from you know, what we know about original sin, to say, well, truthfully before God, there is no one righteous and innocent. Even if you get them to agree with that, they would still say, well, how can a good God allow this persecution to happen to his own redeemed children? 
Uh, it's a question that has troubled people to this very day. Uh, we do cover it in confirmation with our kids uh, several times over, but especially when we get to the first article of the Creed, where we're teaching them that God is the one who provides their body and soul, eyes, ears, and all their members, their reason and all their senses, and still takes care of them. And then they say, well, what about the person who is deaf or blind or any affliction of the body? Right? We say that these come from God, yet not everybody has them. He gives me clothing and shoes, house and home. What about the homeless person? You know, so this is a problem of evil, a problem of suffering that really causes a lot of doubt for people. Now the solution to that problem, and I'm convinced Christianity has the only salutary answer to that, all the philosophies of the world give no real answer, uh, the Christian answer to that is we have a God who actually suffers with us and for us who became incarnate, the God-man Jesus Christ, to suffer in our place that our sufferings will end, so that we can see that our suffering is not a direct reaction or a response from God punishing us for our sin. What does God do with our sin? If I sin this much, does he pour a hurricane on top of me? No. He sends his son to die in my place that I might survive my suffering, that I might live through it and on to everlasting life. Now that's an answer to the problem of evil that no other religion or philosophy can offer. Moses, when he sees the suffering of the people, he questions God. Why did you even send me? You haven't delivered the people like you said you would. Well, is he exactly quoting God correctly? No. God told him what would happen with the plagues. And he seems to have forgotten how specific God had gotten. If you remember the nugget, we'd be delivered. He does not remember that God has already told him about the miracles and signs that he would have to perform, and the mighty hand with which he would drive the people out, and how he would harden Pharaoh's heart. So this was all foretold. Moses just doesn't seem to remember it. So he asks again, why did you send me? Since I've come to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done evil to this people, you have not delivered them at all. Now, how does God respond? How does how does Yahweh respond in six verse one? He says, "I'll show you." <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you. Does he answer the question of why? Does he answer the question why have you? done evil? Why did you send me? Does he actually give Moses the explanation? No. He reiterates what he's already told him, uh, but he does not engage the why. And this is another part of what we explain to our confirmants with this problem of evil. The question itself puts man in a position that he's not in. When you tell God, explain yourself to me, you have now taken God, who is almighty, omniscient, omnipotent, all these things that we are not, transcendent, uh, and you put him in the defendant chair. You're now the judge, he has to explain himself to you. You're the principal, he's the naughty student who's been called to the office to say why he did what he did. You can't put God in that place. Uh, the question itself, the problem of evil, uh, asks a question that we as creatures are not given to ask. And when Moses asks it, as we all do when we suffer, uh, God does not give him the answer. Well, Moses, let me explain it to you. Let me explain it. I'll, I'll, I'll explain myself. Please be happy with me, Moses. No, he just reiterates what he's already said about the deliverance, about what he is going to do to Pharaoh. Uh, he doesn't ask for Moses' approval. He reiterates his word. Uh, now, when you're dealing with somebody who is asking the problem of evil question, you're going to have two different types of people asking it. You're going to have the belligerent, antagonistic atheist who thinks, aha, I caught you, silly Christians. Uh, that person you can put in his place and say, you have no grounds to question God. If he actually exists, then he is transcendent, all-knowing, 
and to put him in the defendant's chair would be contrary to all the attributes we learn about God. Uh, you could also say, do you really want to engage a fool in his folly? <laughs> but as long as you are having that conversation with a belligerent, antagonistic atheist on the problem of evil, it'd be good to remind him that he doesn't know as much about God as he thinks he does. After all, he's the one claiming God doesn't exist. On the other hand, very often the person asking the problem of evil question is not a belligerent, antagonistic atheist. It's a person who is, like Moses, like the foreman, suffering. They are suffering. Uh, and that person, you point them back to the answer that God gives to suffering in Christ. Or in this case, God pointing Moses back to the promise he has made to take care of this, to redeem them. Uh, that's where the person who is suffering and struggling can be re-encouraged by what God has promised and what God has already accomplished in Christ. So I think you can see how the two types of asking the problem of evil question really need two different <coughs> boxing gloves. One, a real hard, iron-fisted boxing glove and knock down the atheist who thinks he knows God well enough to, you know, chide him. And the other, a more uh, velvet glove, caressing and encouraging the person who is struggling honestly with suffering, with suffering, reminding them of God's promises, not uh, scolding them and saying, how dare you question God. Uh, right? Different reaction to different motivation. And so God here gives him the promise once again he, that Pharaoh will be the one driving out the people. He will do it. So let's get into the next promise. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty, Hebrew El Shaddai, but by my name Yahweh I did not make myself known to them. We'll pause there because that's kind of a separate thought. Um, this does not mean that when we see the name Yahweh in Genesis that they didn't know it or use it. This is that God did not explain to them the meaning like he did to Moses in Exodus 3. Right? Because Genesis 4 already says that they began calling upon the name of Yahweh. And so this is where the, the critics and the people who say the Bible contradicts itself go, ha ha, see, Genesis says they know the name, they use it all throughout the book, but in Exodus he says, I didn't make it known to them. What does that mean, to make it known to them? He explains it. In Exodus 3, when he gives the name, he goes into a lengthy explanation of, I am who I am, tell them that Yahweh, the one who does things, is going to redeem them. He gives a lengthy explanation to Moses that we do not have recorded in Genesis. So they have the name throughout Genesis. They don't have the meaning given until Moses has this meaning explained in Exodus 3. All right, so I just wanted to pause there because that's one of those verses people like to pull in and say, aha, your Bible contradicts itself. Well, no, it doesn't. Slow down. Read what it actually says, and it makes sense. Continuing on at verse 4. I also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they lived as sojourners. Moreover, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel, whom the Egyptians hold as slaves, and I have remembered my covenant. Say, therefore, to the sons of Israel, I am Yahweh. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. I will take you to be my people. I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Yahweh, your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will bring you into the land that I swore to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. I will give it to you for a possession. I am Yahweh. Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses because of their broken spirit and harsh slavery. All right, what does Yahweh point Moses to? What does he give him to tell the people? Something new or something old? Something old. What was it? A covenant promised to their fathers, 
Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Does he give them more work to do? Pharaoh has already commanded them to make bricks without straw. Does he now say, uh, make freedom out of slavery yourselves? No. He makes promises. Uh, look at the verbs here. Which ones is God doing? I have heard. I have remembered. I will bring you out. I will deliver. I will redeem. I will take you. I will be your God. I will bring you into the land again in verse 8. I will give it to you as a possession. Is there any confusion as to who is going to be doing the work of redemption here? Is there any question about who the subject of these verbs is? No. God is making abundant promises related back to his covenant, a covenant he made long ago that he is still keeping. He hasn't given it up. He's going to keep it himself. They do not have to help him keep his own promises. He's going to do it. So, what covenant does the church have? What promises or agreements has God made with his church in the New Testament? <coughs> he has promised to come again in glory. Promises to be with us in his word. Yes, he promises to be with his word. There are two <laughs> things where we actually use that word covenant. Yeah, yeah. In the Lord's Supper, the words of institution include the word covenant. This cup is the new covenant or testament in my blood. He's made a new covenant with us, and he is the one keeping it, where he is doing all the work, forgiving our sins, bringing us out of this slavery into the land that he has promised to take us into. He's bringing us out. He will deliver us. The same verbs you see here. He is yet again carrying out. The other time we use the word covenant is often in relation to baptism. When we have our baptisms in church, the word covenant is even used in the prayers. That God is making these promises, setting them free from slavery, redeeming them from their bondage to Satan, and that he will do all these same things again for them. Would the Israelites really saw themselves as slaves then, or just in bondage? You know, tomato, tomato? Yeah, well, you know, someone might have but again, later, don't they say they've never been owned by anyone? Well, I wouldn't exactly slaves. take the, the Jews in Jesus' day to be arbiters of truth. Yeah. It's that, and it's that, they're very foolish for even saying that. We are children of Abraham, we've never been enslaved to anybody. Yes, you have. You're still under Roman occupation. Yeah, I mean, that's the ridiculousness of their claim. That's not, that's not a true statement from them. That just shows they're ignorant of their own history. And that's kind of the point in that one. Moving on. We've looked at the verbs. We've looked at the subjects. How do they respond? It is pure gospel. There's only, let's look for the one verb there that has you as the subject. So God's the subject of verbs like, um, I established my covenant, I promised to give it to him, I have heard their groanings, I have remembered, I will, I will, I will. What's the one verb that's given to the people? You will do all that I've commanded you? No. It's in verse 7. You shall know that I am Yahweh your God. So in this plethora of verbs of what God is doing for his people, the one thing that they're the subject of is actually quite passive, right? Knowing that Yahweh is their God. Now if that doesn't sound like uh, a life of faith, then I don't know if anything else will convince you of a life of faith. Faith is knowing, receiving these promises of God, and knowing who you are in relation to him. A redeemed child. Somebody brought out of this slavery. Somebody delivered from sin, death, and the devil. Uh, there's no other verb given here for the people to do. I will do all of this if 
you do X, Y, and Z. No, no conditionals. I will do all of this after you do X, Y, and Z. Quid pro quo. Nope. As Pastor Johnson preached today, God initiates it. God carries it out from start to finish, and all they are given is knowledge, assurance. Uh, you could even say now confidence in who they are relative to their God. And yet, how do they receive it? How do they respond to this pure gospel? They don't listen. They don't listen. But, before we jump into something like our Old Testament lesson today, Exodus 17, where they quarrel with Moses and they grumble and they test God, because we, by the end of Exodus, we're going to get really tired of this group. We're going to get really angry at the Israelites. And then we should remember that we have met the enemy and he is us. Uh, if you're angry at the Israelites, look in the mirror. Uh, but at this point, we should be a little more sympathetic because it doesn't just say they didn't listen. It gives the rationale. It uses because. It tells us why. Why will they not listen to this string of gospel promises? A broken spirit and harsh slavery. So even when the gospel is proclaimed, and this is gospel, all these promises of God, sometimes it can be heard by brokenness and disbelief. And that's when we keep preaching the gospel. We keep sharing it over and over because they need to hear that no, your brokenness of spirit and harsh slavery is not going to change these promises. You'll see. God will do it. And they will. Right now they're broken by their harsh slavery and they're about to see ten straight plagues of judgment on their enemies and, and be delivered and walk through the Red Sea. Baptism into Moses, as our epistle lesson today said. Uh, they're going to see all of this. After that, you can get frustrated with them when, you know, 40 days after the Red Sea, they're making a golden calf. Come on, guys. Uh, but at this point, we should empathize a little more with them. Uh, that because of their brokenness, their bitterness of life, they are struggling to believe God's promises. Now, if we don't know what that feels like, we might be deluding ourselves. Uh, and you'll meet people who are that broken. Not just by guilt of their own sin, but just broken by life in this world. And the promises of the gospel are for them too. Uh, and they might not believe it the first time around because of the brokenness in their life. Uh, whatever aspect of the world is attacking them, as we pray in the Lord's Prayer and learn in its meanings, the devil, the world, and our flesh do attack us daily. Well, when that world attacks and breaks us down, we have the gospel for that very reason. And when the person you're sharing it with does not believe it instantly, you don't just switch into the law. Okay, they didn't believe the gospel the first time I shared Jesus' promises. Now I'm really going to beat them up. You know, break somebody who's already broken. No, you continue sharing the promises and trust you as the one proclaiming to them that Christ will fulfill His word. His promises are true. I think sometimes we as Christians, when sharing the the gospel and its comfort with family or friends or anybody who's bringing their brokenness to us, we get a little hasty to abandon it if it doesn't feel like it's working. And so we'll resort to something else, usually law. We'll package it nicer than law. Maybe it'll be packaged as Christian living or 40 days of this, 10 ways to do that, 16 steps to a better this. You know, we can package it any sort of way to make it seem nicer, but ultimately that's law. That's law that you're piling on to somebody who's burdened and broken, either by their guilt or by the world or both or everything on top of it. Uh, and that's where uh, we as the Lutheran Church have a distinct advantage that we are the church of the proclaimed gospel. <laughs> We're not going to have a preaching series on... Uh, Ten steps to making yourself a better person, because that is just going to add burden on top of the burden to the people who are already showing up on Sunday, burdened with their guilt, broken by the world in which they are living, and it is a broken world around us. 
Every one of us can be healed of that. Uh, no, we are going to proclaim the gospel. We're going to share it with people who are, who even if they're unbelievers, we'll share it with them. And even if they're believers, we need to share it with them because chances are pretty good that they're not hearing it at their church. That they're not hearing it in what they're listening to or reading, even on recommendation of their pastors and churches. I'm not trying to be a Lutheran exceptionalist here or just say that Lutherans always have it right. No, our preachers need to be careful too. And you as listeners always need to listen and evaluate whether your pastor has slipped from the gospel into preaching more law on top of your broken consciences. But the fact of the matter is, many churches, whatever name's on the door doesn't matter, many churches and many pastors are going to be adding law on top of the people who are already broken by this world. Not gospel. They're not going to be proclaiming the promises of God. Uh, this is where, um, if I could use an analogy, it might soften my seemingly uh, Lutheran gung ho <laughs> uh, If you knew that your friend was going to a doctor who always, or always diagnosed the problem wrong and always prescribed the wrong medication, would you just sit by and say, well, I know he's a believer, he'll be saved in the end? No, the, guy's gonna, the doctor's going to, that quack doctor is going to do real harm to the body. So you tell him, you're going to a quack doctor. He gets every diagnosis wrong. He doesn't prescribe the right medicine. Get out. Find a real doctor. Find a good doctor. Uh, it would be selfish not to. You say, well, I don't want to challenge his choice of doctor. I know he's saved in the end. He'll have the bodily resurrection, even if his body suffers now at the hand of crooked doctors. Well, it's the same thing when we allow people to go to churches that are not going to give them gospel. Yeah, they probably believe the true gospel in their heart. They'll be saved. I'm not saying Lutherans are the only ones in heaven. I'm saying right now, in their life, they may very well be broken and burdened by people who are not addressing the problem correctly and not prescribing the right solution to those problems. Because you can imagine how if your friend is one of these Israelites who's broken under the, the bitter weight of slavery and the broken spirit, and if their pastor unlike Moses, who's proclaiming God's promises to them, if their pastor is adding burdens of the law on top of them, selling them a false hope that if you do this, if you follow these steps, if you do what I tell you to do, then it'll get better, they're going to be broken even further. They're not going to be healed. It's a misdiagnosis of the problem, of just how, how frustrated, struggling, and sinful our world is, and then it's a complete omission of the one saving medicine that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, so for the sake of your friends, no, you don't just have to tell them, uh, hey, you need to be a Lutheran or else. But if they are struggling with the problem, if they are broken, ask them if they've gone and seen their pastor. And if they have, ask them what he said. If it's all law, bring them to your pastor. Because they're going to need gospel at some point in their problem, sinful, broken world living. They're going to need the grace of God. And sadly, many of them are not going to get it. And if we stay closed in, or we stay too shy, or we stay too selfish to have those tough conversations, yes, they may yet be in heaven, but it's awfully selfish of us to deny them spiritual comfort, the consoling, healing words of the gospel now, simply because we think, well, they'll be saved on the last day. So I don't need to give them the gospel now. No, again, if, you were, if they were going to a quack doctor, or if they were hiring an architect who all of his houses fell down on top of people, you would tell them to find a new architect. You'd tell them to find a new doctor. Uh, so yeah, if, they're, if their problems in life are being met with false hope and more law, give them the gospel. Because that's what they need. All right? Good. All right, let's go on. Any questions on that? Pastor? Yes. So when, it, when God says you'll know me then, yes. should these people already have known him? I mean, they had the promises of Abraham and or to Abraham and Isaac. Yeah. And isn't it, I mean, it seems almost like it's more an issue of uh, not believing versus not knowing. Much like the, the atheists you were talking about, he found inside, I think everybody knows, it's written in their heart or whatever, that you know, there is right. God. 
right? Even an atheist knows there is a, there's enough, Paul writes this in Romans, that there's enough in the natural world around us to testify that there is a God so that even the unbeliever on Judgment Day will be condemned by his own ignorance to the world around him, his own denial of the moral law written on his heart. But the revealed word, the word that God reveals through Scripture, does flesh out who that God is, that he's merciful, not just a legalistic God, and it tells us what the real condition of man is. The, the moral law written on our heart might convince us that we're actually okay. Because I've never murdered anybody, so I guess I'm better than most. Uh, but the moral law that God reveals in Scripture shows that, no, even I am a blind, dead enemy of God. Even I am a poor, miserable sinner. Um, and so the, the revealed word does add more. Now, for the Israelites, they do know God. They've heard these promises. Uh, but God is making himself known to them even further. When he says, uh, I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, and you shall know that I am Yahweh your God, he adds, who has brought you out of slavery. Or, yeah, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. So, they do already know the name Yahweh. He's explained it to Moses in more detail as to what the name means. But now they are going to know intimately that he actually fulfills his promises. In the same way we can chide the disciples prior to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection that they didn't listen and believe him. But it actually still requires the death and resurrection to happen to fulfill his word. To actually keep his promises. Then they know... Uh, who Jesus really is, that he's actually fulfilled and kept his word. And so that's what God is showing here, that he, he is the God who has made the promises, and they should trust in those. Now he's going to show that he keeps his promises, and that's what they're going to experience in their life. They're going to know that he actually has kept it, has brought them out, has crushed Pharaoh, drowned him and his whole host in the Red Sea, and of course we all know what they do. Right after that, spend 40 years grumbling against him, even though they knew who he was. We have just three more verses for this part of the lesson that I want us to get through. Uh, after the people don't listen because of their brokenness, Yahweh said to Moses, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to Yahweh, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am uncircumcised lips. But Yahweh spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the sons of Israel and about Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So Moses tries to blame the ineffectiveness on his own lips. He tried that earlier with God, and God got angry with him for, and said, Who made the mouth? I, God, did. Uh, so instead of uh, answering Moses' complaint, he gives them a charge. Go in, get back to work. Uh, in this way, any pastor who preaches the gospel and doesn't feel like it's working, put that in quotes, doesn't get God's explanation for why it doesn't appear to be working. He simply has his charge. Get back to work. Get back to preaching. The people haven't listened yet. They will. Go to Pharaoh, start the judgments, start the plagues. And so that's where we'll start next week, uh, with Moses going back into Pharaoh and starting the redemption, the deliverance of the people, which here too, they haven't believed because of their brokenness, but God does not scorn or punish them for that. He delivers them. All right. I need to run up and get ready for service. Go in peace for those of you who have already been to church today. For those of you who are going to the service next, uh, prepare your hearts to worship the Lord. Amen.